Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, we've got the famous Dutch Bachman doing us the Grant style weave. And we'll have a weekly tip and those soft tackle things that we talked about a few minutes ago. We're going to delve into that a little bit further. But for now, we're the BTs from Boise, Idaho. Pleased to be here with all of you. And uh, I got to find, oh, there's Dutch right there. I'll, uh, Dutch, first off, I want to make you a co-host in case we get cut off. We won't lose okay. the whole the whole call. Okay. And now I'm going to um, <clears throat> spotlight you and read an introduction. Dutch Bachman began his fly tying journey in 1957. Having no supplies, he tied his first fly on an old rusty hook, thread from Mama's sewing basket, a feather found on the ground, and hair cut from his dog. The fly was magnificent. Since that time, he has been mentored by Michael Radinsich and Wayne Llewellyn, tied with many exceptional fly tires, and is a proud member of the Roadkill Round Table Fly Tying Group. It's a group that's been, on, been tying on a regular basis since 1972. Dutch, it's all yours, and go for it. Well, thank you, Al and Gretchen. I appreciate that. Let's um, jump over here. Tonight, uh, we will learn from some folks that have gone before us uh, and some, some very important fly tying lessons that uh, we, we need to understand. Uh, we're going to take a look at a gentleman named Franz Pott. Now, Mr. Pott was uh, an immigrant from Germany. And he was actually a wig maker and, and a barber. And when he got to Montana, he settled in the Bitterroot Valley in Hamilton, which is just south of Missoula, Montana. Uh, and he uh, is credited with producing the first woven hair trout fly in the 1920s. Uh, his flies became the dominant commercial patterns of the first half of the 20th century uh, throughout the Rocky Mountain states. What we're going to see there at the top is something called the pot body weave. Uh, the second fly we do this evening will actually uh, use that weave. We'll demonstrate that, but I want you to pay attention at this point before we get there. Notice how the orange material here on the underbody is slanted at an angle. Uh, that was the way uh, Mr. Pot uh, wove this pattern or wove this body. And um, it's, it's a very effective and beautiful way to do it. And uh, I'm going to show you a little alternative to that tonight uh, to actually line those little orange threads in a nice underbody line. Uh, this is one of the most famous flies that Mr. Pot developed. It's called the Sandy Mite, and uh, it was very, very, very popular and still is in, in many, many places. Um, the woven body and woven hackle collars uh, that Mr. Pot tied were extremely durable. Uh, they were very, very definitely sought after by fly fishers. Uh, they were woven, uh, he used a badger hair and an ox hair, and believe it or not, uh, his flies were considered at a premium at 35 cents a piece or three for a dollar. Uh, that What a bargain. I'd hate to think, well, today his flies actually sell for hundreds of dollars as collector's items. Um, his flies were, were definitely known to uh, catch fish, uh, not just a, a nice fly, but they produced a lot of hookups. Uh, and they, they int he, he intended those to imitate a large caddis and a stonefly nymph. We're also going to be influenced tonight by Mr. George Grant. Uh, Mr. Grant um, was from Butte, Montana. Uh, he passed in 2008, uh, but he was a, he, he patented the Grant Weave in 1939. Uh, and what Mr. Grant did was actually learn the pot weave 
and made one major adjustment to the pot weave. Mr. Pot used three threads uh, in his weaving technique, and Mr. Grant developed a different technique uh, that utilizes uh, two threads, and that's known as the Grant weave. And again, that was pot patented in 1938. Uh, and in 1973, Mr. Grant won the FFI Busick Award. Now, this is something of real special significance, I think, in that <clears throat> this is the book, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the book that Mr. Grant wrote. Uh, and he actually published this book in 1971. And it's just really remarkable. It's, if, if, if When you look at this book, you'll see that he actually typed every word in this book on a typewriter uh, throughout the entire book. And he also then, uh, he drew all the diagrams. And for example, within the book, you'll see diagrams that Mr. Grant provided that shows exactly step by step how the Grant weave uh, should be done. Uh, and you'll notice this picture right here in the middle. This is actually how the the woven uh, hair sticks uh, this is how they look uh, once they've been woven onto the thread but you'll see many pictures today where the uh, the shortest part of this which actually becomes the wing or the collar is straight up and it looks like just one long piece but uh, that occurs with some manipulation but in any case uh, Mr. Grant drew all these diagrams to describe uh, the Grant weave and you'll notice bottom left. Yes, we're actually going to do a, a half hitch as we uh, weave this fly uh, But uh, very very effective and so that prompted me to want to show that this is an RS2 and I'm going to show you four fly patterns here that are some of my favorites that are these are typically flies I'll use on the bottom of my rigging the bottom fly uh, sometimes I fish two of them at once, but the RS2, this is one that very similar to what uh, we saw earlier in a, in a session, the IOBO fly, and it's got crystal flash as the wing up there, of course, and it's pulled across the body. Uh, but that's a very, and you'll notice on that one, uh, you'll see a glass bead. I, I don't use weighted flies at all. And uh, instead, uh, for any kind of an emerger pattern, I like to put a glass bead on that pattern because uh, to me that seems to replicate uh, the gas bubble that an aquatic insect will generate as they start to rise. <clears throat> Another fly in this same group, with, in my mind, is the uh, Koki Bondi. Uh, this is also a very interesting fly, how it was developed. It's very unique in that this is a fly from Wales. And the fly was actually named uh, twice uh, for the, the same name, but for two reasons. One, there's a beetle in Wales called the Koki Bondi, and it's black and red. Uh, but also, uh, there was actually a fowl, or a, kind of a chicken animal, that was called a Koki Bondi. And, and uh, this fly originally was tied using the rooster feather from the Koki Bondi. And it's hard to find the cocky bondy feathers today. So today we use a furnace type of feather. Uh, but one other thing that's really unique about this fly is that uh, the body is actually uh, peacock hurl and ostrich hurl. You can actually tie them in at the same time. Uh, and it's very, very effective. But what led me to all of this was that this is another pattern that I, I really like to use, uh, again, as a bottom fly, you'll notice it's a woven body. And this this weave is very different than the uh, Grant weave or the pot weave that we're gonna look at. This pattern, I started out with this hook, same hook, and uh, put the glass bead on it uh, that I like to use. I'll show you this one quickly uh, because it's really an effective and a very simple weave that, that you can do. It's called the overhand weave. And you'll notice we've got uh, a, a yellow side and a, and a green side. Uh, to do this overhand weave, we're going to have the yellow side, we're going to have the green side. And very simply, all we do is we take the yellow 
over top of the green and do an overhand knot. And notice when we do the overhand knot and we begin to close it up on top of the hook shank and the yellow on the bottom, just like that. I'm going to then start to pull each strand in opposite directions and I'm going to form a little figure eight. You'll see a little figure eight that shows up there. Now what I'm most concerned about is that yellow loop on this side. Uh, that's that you want those to be in a line in alignment uh, from back to front so you can do that very easily as you're pulling these two strands you can control where that yellow goes a lot of way, times just by moving the green one so I want that yellow tight on the side and I can move this up or down as I need to the green one up and down to make sure that the yellow one is exactly on the side where I want it and a little snug close. There's my loop. Go over the hook, start to close it. Now that yellow loop is on the right side. So there's my figure eight yellow loops exactly on the side. And I can do that by raising the yellow, lowering the green, but I can move them around. And by moving these two threads or strands around, I can actually line up where that little yellow loop is going to be. And when I tighten this now, after doing the first one, I'm going to not only tighten it, but I'm also going to tighten it and push back just a little bit. That kind of compresses it into the body. So I'm going to get it in position, tighten it and back. And I, th I think that's enough room. So now I'm going to turn my vise this way. So now we can see that the there's separation between the glass bead and the body. That's all the space I need right there. I can see that my yellow loops are in alignment. And uh, just a word of caution, uh, you want to be careful where you begin this weave on a scud style hook like this. Uh, this pattern, this weave can also be very effective on a straight shank. Uh, but I like it in this case uh, as kind of a wet fly or a soft tackle uh, on a curved shank. So at this point um, I'm going to begin a thread wrap. I'm going to take both of these strands. I'm going to bring them both forward at the same time but not pull on them. I'm just going to lift my thread over that opening and capture both strands and pull the tightening wrap is always straight up over again behind the glass bead straight up and then I do this I'll take my thread and I'll go around both strands go around both strands twice now I just gently slide my thread loops up and a tightening wrap. Now I just put a, a, a actually a whip finish. So was, that was a half hitch by doing that. So now I can come in here and turn this upside down. I'll compress that. Now I'll take the tip and Up pull it up. There you go. And roll it back. I can continue to do that. Compress it. Lift up. Roll it back. That can begin to bend those barbs. Also, I've, I keep a hackle plier on the uh, post of my vise. Uh, and I can put the tip in that post of my vise with the hackle sticking out. And I like to take actually the edge of my scissors and very gently run my edge of my scissors down the rachis on both sides. And that will bend those feathers as well. Just take a couple wraps. All those are started to, I've already bent those. I still like to pinch them back a little bit just to make sure they're going in the correct direction. Bring them around. And one of the advantages of preparing the, the hackle like this before you come to the hook shank is that you can avoid the the 
the hackle barbs encumbering each other as you wrap them around. So normally, uh, for example, uh, when you take hackle around something like this, when it, when you come and back up here, th that's where you'll see those hackle barbs compressed. And if you continue, then they get twisted. They're underneath the hackle itself. Really looks bad. So I'll come up like that and. Now that's a very simple body weave. It's not at all like the pots we were going to do next, uh, but it's a pretty effective. It segments a body, segments a body, and I, I think it's a. It looks pretty good. And, and again, as I mentioned, the reputation of pot flies or any kind of woven fly like this, that body is very durable. And um, I, this is one of my go-to patterns right here for the bottom fly. So, with that, we're going to jump forward now, and uh, we're going to begin to look at the pot's weave. And to do that, we're going to look at, this is typically the type of hook I would use to do a pot's weave. And uh, normally on this pattern, I do like to uh, have a tail and uh, because these typically were stonefly imitations but a tail and uh, you'll notice uh, right here I put a thread bump right there and I usually do that with red thread and then I actually put UV on it and that thread bump becomes a kind of a stopper for the first weave that we'll do on the body um, that's that's kind of the hook I would use, but for tonight, uh, I'm actually going to use that particular hook. But it, it's more like this. It it does not it does not have the tail and so forth. Now, <clears throat> one other thing I wanted to mention, and again, I'm sure everybody knows this too. Uh, it's very important uh, when we put our hook in the vise that we make sure that the the hook shank is level. And the reason for that is um, uh, if, if your hook shank is out of proportion, let's say you're, you're, this is kind of an extreme, but let's say your, your hook shank, your eye is tilted way up. Well, what happens if you're tying a fly that says you begin the tail directly above the hook point? Look where that is. But if I put this hook in the correct configuration, being level, like that, now I go right straight, and that's it. look where the, that tail would begin here. So it's very important. That's one main reason why you want to make sure your hook is in the vise properly and um, level. Uh, the other thing, and, and I cheat on this sometimes, is I like to tie a lot of salmon flies and... Um, they come on big hooks typically, and um, sometimes I feel like I should have the red cross insignia on the door of my tying room because I'm just constantly poking myself with the point sticking out. But we, we catch the bend of the hook back here, right in that section, because right about here is where the taper of the hook to the hook point is going to occur. And by grabbing the hook back here at the bend, uh, we can the jaws can actually compress the hook at a place where the diameter of the hook shank is is still the same. It hasn't tapered yet, but it sure can be a nuisance uh, right there. As a matter of fact, uh, when, when I'm tying a salmon fly, this is very typically what it looks like. Um, typically, I'm using a blind eye hook like this, but I came across these little deals right here. Uh, if you go into any place that sells pierced earrings, 
Uh, this is that little deal you can buy where you buy pierced ear rings that actually just slides. It's, it's intended to slide over a pierced ear ring, but you can slide it over a hook point. And now while you're dressing that fly and your finger hits that hook point, you're not going to stab yourself. Uh, so those little deals right there are pretty handy. So we're going to use this particular type of hook for tonight. And uh, it's actually going to begin like this. Now, in order to dress this fly using the pot weave on the body and the grant weave for the collar, make sure it's straight. It's important that I line up the materials on the correct side. Now, this is important because when I come over here now to actually begin the weave, like this. It makes a difference which side the material's on. And you'll see after I start just one weave, you'll see exactly what I mean. Now what I've learned too on doing this pots weave for a body, if I turn my hook, rotate my vise so my hook is upside down, now it's changed sides. Materials are on the opposite side. So my point is, well, this is exactly how I want it to be. I want this material to be on the left side, and I want this material to be on the right side. I want my dark side on the left, my light side on the right. And by the way, this dark side is some pretty cool material. It's uh, made by Uni, and it's actually mohair. And I like this a lot because this fly pattern is actually going to create a body that's going to look like this. And you'll notice on the top of it, that's, it looks like it's, all, it's a hump. It's all one color, but the bottom is not. The yellow on the right side, green on the left. I'm going to go behind, in front of, around. And now behind, this is the one that covers it up. Now from here, I can actually, oh, excuse me, one more. Now I can begin the weave. And here's, here's how this weave works. You hold the dark material straight up. The lighter material goes around the darker material at the base. Notice I'm tightening it up down there at the base, right at the hook, right there. Now, what Mr. Grant did at this point was he would just come across here like this and do another weave. And you can see by doing that, that yellow portion is actually going to be at an angle. Well, I, I wanted to experiment it around with this, and I discovered this. I can wrap the yellow around the base. What happens if I bring that yellow straight up? Now watch what happens. I don't hope you can see this. But down here at the base, by bringing the, the mohair now around, see how that's going to actually roll that yellow right in place. So once I do the next wrap, down at the base, stay to the left side of the hook, go around, and so it flipped up again. Now you can see, by doing this particular weave, I'm going to align those yellow marks in a straight line. So once again, come around, tight, move her around, roll the yellow in. Tight base, move her around, rolls the yellow. So I think we're going to stop right there. I got those yellows in a nice line. Come back to this point. Remove tag. Now I can bring both of these forward. And I'm going to do the same kind of thing I did on the other pattern. I'm going to bring my thread over the top twice. And those are edged edge. I never wrap thread on top of the preceding wrap. So it's edged edge.
All right. Now this is where we build. We're going to build the hackle for the Grant's weave. That's going to go in this spot right here. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to put this finish, take the hook out of the vise because we're going to need the vise to do the Grant weave. Okay. Now for this strong material, uh, you can use uh, six aught thread or stronger. Uh, you can use mono, uh, any, any kind of strong thread, and um, you'll you'll take that. That it's about you want that length of thread. It's going to be hard to see on the screen here, but it's actually thread here. That, that's about two feet long. And after I take a two foot long piece at the end, I'm going to bring those butt ends together like this. And then just down from that, I'm going to do an overhand knot. And then just down a couple inches from that, I'm going to do another overhand knot. So now I've got a loop that will fit over that pin. The rest of this loop will go around a post of another vise. Now I'm going to build something that Mr. Grant called hair sticks. He built hair sticks by utilizing long hair. Like I said, he liked to use badger hair. He used uh, ox hair. Um, you, want it, you want the hair to be at least two inches long. Uh, so that you have enough room that you can weave it properly and so forth. Uh, this particular hair is a bull elk mane, and it's really nice and long, as you can see. This is kind of ideal in my book. I like it that long. So what I'm going to do is come in here with my scissors. I'm going to cut off a section of this bull elk mane. hold on to the tip ends and I want to get rid now you'll notice how how the, the the distance or the width of this end where all those butt ends are watch what happens if I start with a comb just down here at the butt ends and start at the end look what happens how easily I'm pulling a lot of stuff out of there I, I didn't start down here try to push a whole bunch it's like pushing a whole bunch of spaghetti I'm going to start down here and as I pull stroke hair out of there, I'm thinning that up, sometimes referred to as cleaning hair. The next thing I do is place this bundle into a hair stacker. Now there's the tips of that whole bundle. So when I pull all that out. Now from this, I usually have a paper towel that I sit in front of me. And what I'm going to attempt to do here is pull the tips of this bundle just a few at a time. You can see there's three right there. Look how long those are. I'll lay this on my paper towel right in front of me. I'll come back and pull a couple more. Now I've got a couple more. I'm going to make new bundles of five to seven hairs. Stack them. Pull the tips out. Now what I'm looking for is to be able to come all the way down here to the end and I know my tips are pretty well level 
but I want to come down here to my butt ends and I want to make sure they're level too. So I'll find the, the shortest one of those five and I'll make them level. The next thing I'll do is I've already poured some glue into a cap like this and I like to use caps from uh, prescription medicine bottles uh, because if you look on the inside of this thing it's just perfect for what we're doing. It's kind of got a cap inside of a cap but you'll notice on the side it's got these holes. So I can put the right amount of glue I want in there and typically when I'm doing this process I lay this down so it's actually not level on my desk but that one side is up just a little bit so the glue that's in here slides down to one end. Uh, at the end of the session of making these hair sticks, George Grant called these hair sticks, when I get to the point of uh, I'm finished making hair sticks, I can just pour, open my glue bottle, and where those holes are, I can just pour that right back into my glue bottle. So now I've, I've got my five strands, the tips and the butts are level. I've got my glue in the cap. I'm going to dip the butt ends into the glue. And when I hold it up, there'll be a, like a little bulb of glue right there. Okay. I'll reach down here and find the, the tips. And by that time, that little bulb of glue up here is running down. So I'll tilt it this way. And this is all now stuck together because that little bulb of glue is holding all these butt ends uh, nice, nicely together. Okay, so this would all be together. This would be one hair stick. And now the next step, and, and I'll, I'll caution you, uh, you might want to get ready for a, a screenshot because you're going to see a piece of equipment here that is really high dollar, that uh, is one of the most crucial uh, tools to do this grant weave. There it is. Isn't that pitiful? That's just an old cardboard deal I made. And uh, I call it my sorting tray. Because what George Grant said was, after you dip the butts in glue, lay it on the edge of a piece of wood or a, or a book and let that glue dry. Sometimes a little drop of glue forms. It'll actually drop by, down. So I, I take these bundles I just dipped in glue and I lay them across like this and there's as you can see I actually took the time to cut a groove on both sides and I can lay that hair stick in the proper groove and just let it sit there and if it's going to drop or drip glue it falls on here then after I've let all of those glue butt ends dry I can come back in here and pick this up and now I've got a real I've got a real hair stick, and a real hair stick looks like this. So you can see on that end, there's actually glue. And if I hold on to that and turn it over, here's my tip ends, and they're all pretty level. But that's kind of the length I'm looking for. This is one inch in this space. So that's about a one, two, about a two and a half inch hair stick. And that, that works pretty good. I, I kind of like that size. So here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to actually go on a weave right now. And we're going to use this hair stick. The next tool that we use, and this is the only other tool really that we use, is um, you can actually buy a hackle plier that's got this little tag or welded on and uh, Todd Collins in Butte, Montana is the guy that has those but you need a, a hackle plier like this because what happens next is I'll turn this around so I have the tips sticking out and I will already know how long do I want my my uh, hackle to be. All these little dots on here represent different distances. So all the way to the end is one inch. 
and I've got seven eighths and five eighths and so forth. So if I want a half inch bundle, I can come in there and I'll put the tips right on the dots of, that represent a half an inch. Now when I turn this over, I know the part that's actually going to turn out to be the collar on my fly is the correct length. So this is one method to do this. This is how George Grant did it. Uh, there, there's another way you can do it, and this is also kind of handy, I think. Um, another way is just to take a ruler, and I'll measure the distance I want. Let's say a half inch. I'll get the correct length, say half an inch. I'll take a different kind of hackle plier. Doesn't have all those numbers and such. And I can grab the whole bundle. Now I've got the hair stick and a hackle. So here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to actually start to weave. So I'll get the length that I'm looking for. Remember we've got this loop going on here attached to the pin and attached to the stem of a vise on this side over here. Wax right in there, overhand knot right there. I'm going to push the hair stick so it goes between both threads. I'm going to push my hackle up close to the thread right here. I'll take the rest of my hair stick and by holding that in place now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to grab my hackle and pinch my hackle, hair stick, and loop all at the same place. Reach around here, I'm going to grab my hair stick, bring it around, up and to the left. Now I've just put a little half hitch kind of knot underneath my fingers right there. Now I'm going to separate this loop I'm going to drop the hair stick between the two loops and pull it down. Now that just compressed another little half hitch kind of deal up against the first one, which is underneath my thumb and middle finger. Now I can take the rest of the hair stick. This is where I do a half hitch. I'm going to go with the, with the glue end. I'm going to go around the loop, the thread, come up and slide to the left. And I can feel it stop and I hope that means it's up against the first two loops or knots. And there it is. That's what it's supposed to look like. Keep it pooched together. So after I do every weave, I'll make sure that the ones I have in place are looking good. This time let's use this. Okay, so I'm going to open the hackle plier. Now, if you get one of these from Todd Collins, he typically makes or puts, the, he welds this onto a hackle plier. And if you're familiar with the Eng English style hacker, hackle plier, that's what he uses. And I really don't care for those because they, they twist very easily. You can slip them really easily. So I like a little wider place where I can compress it open. So I'll come in here and I'll find the correct length. I'll lay those tips right there. Now I've got a hair stick ready to go. You may see some people take the hair stick and actually separate the loop and drop it between. That works okay. I'm going to come forward, lift it up until I get the hair stick right at the base of the loop. Once again come around up and to the left. That just put a little half hitch under there. 
separate, go between, down to the left, half hitch, straight up kind of wiggle, slide it in, and when I get to this point, I, I don't want a lot of slack. I mean, just like in casting, slack is not your friend. And and so I like to make sure I'm, I'm getting a, a good tight knot on there. Slide it forward. Oh, look what happened. Look what I pulled too hard. I did that on purpose so you can see what happens when a hair stick breaks. To the left, now they're together, just like that. Now I can straighten them up here if I want to, or I can slide them if I want to. Straighten them by, by that's by pooching them out so the top straight stands a little straighter. Then slide it in, and you want to be careful when you're sliding it together because this can actually break too. Um, I, I, I should mention I I, I really enjoy tying fully dressed salmon flies and everything I know I learned from Jim Ferguson but I, I enjoy these and these grant uh, th these flies are exactly the same if you don't have the patience to build these hair sticks and to do the weave properly and so forth it it's very time consuming it's very labor intensive uh, and if you don't have the patience to do that then uh, George Grant weave as your know, flies probably wouldn't be for you. So we can keep going with this and typically uh, I'm going to look for uh, something like um, 15, 16, 18, uh, th that kind of number of um, hair sticks. So what I'm going to do is just kind of fast forward everything well, I'm going to actually pick up and with the ends, the end of the weave that had the knots, I'm going to take this end I'm going to tie it in exactly like a hackle. Weave this exactly like hackle because that's what it is. I would put a head on there. I'm just going to go ahead and we'll finish it. Finish this off. Well, I do have a question for you. John is asking, what did you do with the long ends? The long ends? I would, sus I would suspect the long butt ends that you had remaining after tying your, uh, your half hitch. Oh. Okay, that's a good question. Um, once you have tied in the number of hair sticks that you need, and you've got the width that you need, uh, you go in there with some fine tip scissors and cut those long ends of the hair sticks off. So, and, and you just, just a, a slight nub uh, after you cut them off, but all, you, you cut all those long ends off. And... Um, then you're left with, uh, you're left with something that would look more like this, where all of those long ends have been cut off. Got it. So that's where they would go. Yep. 
by the way that came out beautiful i i was watching to see how it would come together for you and it was good job man good job thank, thank you al thank you they're fun to tie okay there you are and yet that, that's pot flies not grant flies but yes yeah these and, were uh, tied by pots right and frank johnson donated them and then they're framed by steve jensen yeah right there um i had uh, i've got one of the pot flies myself but uh i had another original that i took apart to make sure that the information that i got on weaving it was correct and yeah. anyway what <laughs> oh yeah it was a hundred dollar fly gretchen yeah he's got the bt special and then there's the <clears throat> badger hair likes? and green and then the royal coachman and the black ant on this presentation are there any mites on there jim no it's just uh, royal coachman black ant and the badger uh hair in green which and then the vt special number six another popular pattern he act he, he of course the mites but he tied one called the fizzle <laughs> it was uh, very very popular thank you dutch so much for the for the presentation and now Welcome. we're to um we're the to the point of the weekly tip and um we're going to talk a little bit more about the soft tackles that we did last week actually that presentation created more questions that it did solutions but that's all right and we're going to talk a lot more about uv glue and when we get to the uv glue portion we're going to have something we don't normally have and we're going to have a short tip from one of our viewers but anyway let's get to let's get to the all right here's the tip last week if you'll recall let me get my other glasses out here so i can see what i'm doing Last week, we tied this fly right here, right up on top there, the one with the fluffy white tail. And uh, we thought it looked pretty good. We went and, and somebody in the audience suggested dunking it in water. We did. And the front part of the fly got wet and the back part of the fly, well, it, it didn't get as wet. We've done a bunch of experimenting this week. And anyway, before we get into that experiment experimentation and the actual tip, we just wanted to talk to you about uh, tying a fly that's uh, that we that's going in our own fly boxes. This came from a, from a, the a window feather on a on a ringneck pheasant, and this is the base base end of the of the fluff. And as you can see, we added weight by but just putting some beads in between some sections of dubbing. Real simple. Just add the number of beads that you want to add to make it sink as fast as you want it to sink, or don't put any at all, whichever. Let's just get get it's to a our weird looking fly. <laughs> it's a weird looking fly. And that's why it's going into the into the box because we've learned one thing over the years that if you show them something similar to what they've been seeing, but a little bit different, it often gets a strike. Now here's the. It's more of a question to all of you. Last week we did this one and we tied it out of a feather, soft tackle and chickaboo, and this is one of the soft tackle feathers, and um, used the, this fluff for the tail, thinking that it was going to get wet. And um, well, here, let me just dunk it in some water. I've got some water over here. I'll just dunk it in the water real quick. and uh we'll just dunk that thing in there and now we'll get back here and the comment at the time was darn that thing sure didn't collapse very much in fact i want you to notice something that it's the very tips of that feather that are wet and the rest of it's dry well the old wheels got to turning and we got to looking at the different chickaboo feathers or the soft tackle feathers in the soft tackle chickaboo pelt. And I want you to notice that the fibers in the back part of the, let me move this and let me get my pointer. All right. The fibers at the back part of the stem from about here to about here, 
are just a bit different. They're a lot crispier and thinner than these fibers here, which are a lot thicker, except on the very, very tips. Well, what our experimentation has discovered, and I'm just gonna reach over here and dunk this into the water. And then we'll come back to the vise. Is I want you to notice that again, again it's, it's, it's wet on the tips and it's dry down here into the actual fiber. And of course, this is all wet and collapsed. That's what we wanted. Well, I got to thinking about this. Is this some type of a cheap alternative to a CDC? I don't know. Been playing with it all week long. And I'll tell you when I get uh, fibers that look like, like this, Here's one that's been wet and dried out. But these are, were the ones that got wet real quick. And these are the ones that did not. So I can tell you that when I hit the stream this year, I am going to have some CDC substitute working for me just to see what I can, what I can have it do. Because it is amazing how long it takes this stuff to get wet. And you know, it travels awful darn fast as it goes through the air. Uh, in the in the false casting, and I cannot believe that no wetter than this is, except right out of here in the tips. But that wouldn't be pretty dry by the time it got delivered to the water. Again, I'm offering this as ideas and thoughts for all of you. Uh, hope you'll uh, come back after a summer of, uh, of fishing and have some reports for us. But now let's get back to us. We want to talk about the UV glue a little bit more, a little bit of a follow-up, and then we're going to have a little bit of a demonstration from David Buckner. But for right now, let's talk about the UV glue that we talked about last week, and we mentioned the fingernail polish, or the UV fingernail, whatever. Fingernail gel. Gel, that's right, that's what it is, fingernail <laughs> gel. It was a reasonable price. Uh, it probably at about a third of what the price for the regular stuff that we use in fly time. I mentioned last week that uh, I thought that that uh, surfboard covering, the UV stuff for surfboard uh, coating might be an option. Well, I got an email a couple of days later, one of the guys in Australia that normally is on the call, uh, he was out fishing and uh, saw it on, on the uh, Facebook rerun. He buys this stuff from the surfboard shop on a regular basis. And he goes there and he takes this bottle, which he calls a little bottle, it's about four ounces, and they give it to him for eight bucks out of a gallon. He's been using this for his UV glue forever. His name is Robin Shenton in Port Macquarie, Australia. So I get an email around the same time. All through the week, I've been getting emails on this from people all over the place. Rick Ziegler in Iowa said, hey, we use 3D printing fluid. And that comes in multiple colors. So you buy that stuff by the, they, they send it, sell it to you in kilo packages or kilo bottles. I didn't know they sold that stuff in kilos and in 500 gram bottles, which is a half a kilo. Anyway, bottom line is it's uh, for $16. Well, for that price, that puts it at about four ounces, I think, if my metric conversion is working. Anyway, bottom line is about four bucks for four ounces. Then another person sent me this deal. It said they use it in jewelry making to actually cast different things and glue it and dry it in really quick in these molds. Well, that sounded really cool. And David Buckner comes along and he says, I got a fly to show you. And so he shows us this fly and let me do a screen share here real quick. These are some David Buckner flies that he does UV glue spinners. Let's take a look. Now this is one of the original ones, the original one that he sent to me. It's got a hair glue spinner on it. Interesting, really interesting concept. Now here's some other versions, the original there at the top and a couple of different ones. Let's find out if this thing works. Well, there it goes. You can see it in action. That is absolutely amazing. But that's not all. David had also come up with the saltwater um, spinners, and he uses um, a section of turkey wing that's been 
strengthened with UV. Anyway, and then the last is a freshwater option and it's a porcupine parasol where the flotation device is made out of porcupine quills. Really, really innovative. But David, there you go now. Yeah. How in the devil <laughs> do you get those things to go around and around like that? Well, I had the, the best time with Al because I can send him the crazy flies that I tie. <laughs> and um, not the, the ones I'm typically using, but the ones I'm thinking about. I'm kind of like him. He talked about getting up in the middle of the night and tying flies and, and thinking about them and such. And I'm the same way. Started off tying saltwater flies several years ago. I live on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And, but the last year or so, I've been tying freshwater uh, trout flies primarily and learning a lot of the new materials. What I've done is tried to use a lot of natural materials uh, for reaching back to the saltwater side to create spinners um, and different unique uh, saltwater flies and freshwater flies. And that's where that spinner um, or the propeller came into, into my mind. Uh, with First with a turkey feather, um, actually uh, burning a hole through the uh, stem and holding the, the feather at a twisted angle with a uh, Swiss clip and, and using UV to to uh, stiffen the feather and make it a propeller. Started thinking about spinning deer hair and making a propeller and um, came up with the, with the one y'all saw, uh, one with two blades and one with a single blade. And that last fly that, that Al showed, going back to the, the trout flies, um, those are porcupine quills. Uh, as I think back to a lot of the materials having kind of grown up with synthetics and now using more natural materials um, and thinking about the properties, uh, the inside of that porcupine quill to me looked like styrofoam. So I'm like, well, it's probably buoyant. And that's why I made that parasol <laughs> and just basically spun uh, porcupine quills um, around a post and uh, actually a needle with some, uh, with some mono and uh, made that parasol and used a lot of UV to, to, to bind them together at the base. But, but it's really, you know, as you think about the, the materials you're using, think about alternative uses. Um, and there's things like, you know, bonding agents like UV resin uh, that make them easy to, to conform to, to different uses. That's it, Al. Uh, there's one thing I would like you to mention that you told me about a UV glue that you use that I had not heard about before. You said it was called Silver Creek Flex Resin? Yeah, I, I use Silver Creek. And um, I'll be glad to, to share the contact information. Fell in the U.S., uh, mixes this stuff, and it is the best I've ever used. Uh, tack free and use a high powered uh, UV light with it uh, has worked wonderfully. I've probably gone through a hundred bottles of this stuff. Uh, use a lot of UV resin on, on the salt water flies. Okay. Well, great. Now there's one, one more thing to see. We're just going to add a spotlight on a side by side. One of the first things I did is I asked David, I said, okay, how about coming in on fly tying Friday, maybe this fall, and uh, showing us how to do this? He says, well, I don't know how to do Zoom. Would you teach me? And so we've been, we've been going back and forth. And bottom line is, we've been thinking about conducting a uh, Zoom class over the summer. If we can get enough interest, we'll, uh, we'll go to the work of putting it together. And so what I want from all of you out there listening in is you see my email address. You know now how to get a hold of us or you can get a hold of us via Facebook and leave a message there, though you're more likely to get it read by sending it to the email address. And um, if there's enough interest in us going to the work of putting together a Zoom class, we will do it. 
We I'll hopefully be before you all are getting ready to demonstrate your flies at the FFI Virtual Expo in, I think it's November. But anyway, anything else, David? Don't text him. Oh yeah, I don't read text. I, I, <laughs> don't text him, I got send that, emails. I got that turned off. <laughs> <clears throat> you, you know, starting out covering, you know, the, the cameras and video equipment, lighting, the setup, um, Zoom software, uh, other softwares we might need. Uh, the presentation itself, I think it'd be helpful. And I was on the, the fly tying group call the other night and, and Jerry was talking about trying to grow the community to, to demonstrate for the FFI Expo sure. later in the year. And it's just sure. become so mainstream with fly tying. I think it'd be helpful to grow that community. I, I don't disagree. And I happen to know that there's several excellent presenters on this call, as a matter of fact. One of them was talking tonight, as a matter of fact, that could very well help with this type of a type of a deal. So I'll be watching my email, and if we get enough interest, we'll go ahead and do that. And if not, then David and I'll work our own deal on the side. 